I firmly believe that discipline is the cornerstone of success. It is the driving force behind every great achievement, and it is the key that unlocks the door to a life of abundance and fulfillment. Without discipline, our dreams remain elusive fantasies, and our potential lies dormant, waiting to be unleashed. Daily self-discipline is not a one-time event or sporadic burst of motivation. It is a way of life, a commitment to consistently making the right choices, even when they're difficult or uncomfortable. It is about embracing delayed gratification and trading short-term indulgence for long-term satisfaction. When we examine the lives of those who have achieved extraordinary success, we find a common thread, discipline. They understand that success is not an overnight phenomenon, but the result of small, consistent actions taken day in and day out. They have mastered the art of self-discipline and use it as a vehicle to progress steadily towards their goals. I know it's easy to get caught up in the allure of instant gratification. We live in a world where shortcuts and quick fixes are constantly marketed to us. But true success is not found in shortcuts. It is found in the discipline to do the necessary work, to go the extra mile, and to persist in the face of challenges. Daily self-discipline is about creating positive habits that serve as the foundation for success. It is about taking control of our thoughts, because our thoughts shape our actions, and our actions shape our destiny. It is about setting clear, compelling goals, and then developing the discipline to pursue them relentlessly. I often say that we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. That's why it is crucial to surround ourselves with individuals who uplift and inspire us, who share our commitment to growth and discipline. The right associations can fuel our motivation and provide the support and accountability we need to stay on track. But let me be clear. Discipline is not about depriving ourselves or becoming rigid and joyless. It is about making choices that align with our long-term vision and values. It is about finding a balance between short-term pleasures and long-term rewards. Discipline allows us to experience true freedom, the freedom to live life on our terms, to pursue our passions, and to make a positive impact on the world. Discipline means taking the hard road, the uphill road, to do what's right for yourself and for other people. It's about disciplining your emotions so you can make good decisions. It's about having the discipline to control your ego so it doesn't get out of hand and control you. It's about treating people the way you would want to be treated and doing the tasks that you don't necessarily want to do, but that you know will help you or help your team. It's about facing your fears. It takes discipline to face your fears so you can conquer them. So, how do we cultivate daily self-discipline? It starts with a decision. A decision to take responsibility for our lives and to commit to personal growth. It requires us to identify our weaknesses and areas where we need to improve, and then develop strategies and systems to overcome them. It demands consistency, resilience, and a willingness to learn from our failures. I want to leave you with a powerful quote. We must all suffer one of two things. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret and disappointment. The pain of discipline is temporary, but the pain of regret lasts a lifetime. Choose discipline. Embrace it as a guiding principle in your life. And remember, it is the daily acts of self-discipline that will lead you to the extraordinary life you desire and deserve. Many people yearn for instant transformation, a miraculous change that will revolutionize their lives overnight. But the truth is, lasting change rarely happens that way. It is the result of consistent, deliberate action taken day after day, week after week, and year after year. Imagine a sculptor who carves a masterpiece out of a block of stone. Each strike of the chisel may seem insignificant on its own, but it is through the accumulation of these small, repetitive actions that a magnificent sculpture is born. In the same way, it is the accumulation of our daily actions that shapes our lives. The power of small, repetitive actions lies in their ability to compound over time. Just like compound interest multiplies our financial investments, Consistent actions compound to create remarkable results. It is through the accumulation of small steps that we climb mountains, achieve great feats, and transform our lives. Consider the habit of exercise. Committing to 30 minutes of physical activity each day may not feel like a significant change in the beginning. But the key to harnessing the power of small, repetitive actions is consistency. It is not the occasional bursts of effort that create lasting change. It is the daily commitment to doing what needs to be done. It is finding the discipline to show up every day, regardless of how we feel, and taking those small steps towards our goals. 
Furthermore, we must be intentional about the actions we repeat. Just as a farmer carefully sows the seeds they plant, we must choose our habits and behaviors wisely. We must identify the small actions that align with our goals and values, and then repeat them consistently. By doing so, we sow the seeds of success and reap a bountiful harvest. Remember, every action, each time you make a conscious decision to eat a healthy meal, to invest in your personal growth, to nurture your relationships, or to show kindness to others, you're taking a small step towards creating the life you desire. And when you repeat those actions day after day, the results become extraordinary. You've got to have family goals, personal goals, and worthy projects you would like to support. Not just income goals, but a full variety of things. If you can develop an appetite for all of that, reasons, reasons make the difference. If you have enough reasons, you can do spectacular things. There's an ancient script that says, without a vision, we die. And if I can get people caught up in thinking about where they would like to go, who they would like to meet, the kind of income they would like to have, the kind of skills they would like to develop, the influence they would like to have, the reputation they would like to build. Would you like to be an entrepreneur? Or would you like to have a masterful management career? Would you like to be a better parent? What kind of influence would you like to have on the people around you? Would you like to influence the industry you're in? There's a whole wide range of things that we need an appetite for. Things to accomplish. And that's called the promise of the future. Without that promise, life becomes a little less worth living. If the promise is clear, we will pay the disciplines, we'll pay the price, we'll read the books, we'll take the classes, we'll learn the skills. So, that's one of the first things, articulate the promise. A big job parents have these days is getting kids to see the promise of the future, the possibilities, the opportunities. When I used to cross my fingers and say, I sure hope things will change for me, he said, Mr. Roan, for things to change for you, you've got to change. I used to hope the economy would change or my boss would change and become more benevolent. I used to hope that circumstances would change, the difficulties would go away. But he said, things aren't going to change. It's going to be like it's always been. But if you change, everything will change for you. That sort of is the centerpiece of the philosophy I've been trying to teach all these years. And I think that's one of the best quotes. It's a promise he gave me. If you will change, everything will change for you. But if you won't change, the next five years will probably be just about like the last five. But anytime you want to, you can learn from the last five and make the next five years of your life totally different from the last five. If you'll make some little simple beginning changes for your health, for your income, being more valuable in the marketplace, things you want for yourself and for your family and all the rest, small pieces at a time. The best is to substitute a poor habit with a good habit. If you've got some bad habits as far as your health is concerned, if you start some good ones, my mama taught an apple a day, and my father will be 92 and has never been ill. I've never been ill. My children, my grandchildren, mama taught us so well, those simple basic good habits of good health that we followed all these years, and the payoff is extraordinary. So maybe you've got something like smoking that you shouldn't do. But rather than just trying to quit that, what if you started something positive and you got so inspired about doing that, that inspired you then to start changing something that was negative? Looking at your own desires, looking at your own possibilities, and then stretching yourself and seeing if you can become all that you can become, earn all that you can earn, share all that you can share, make steady progress in that direction, to meet that success. If there are books provided that you don't read, classes provided that you don't take, music provided that you don't listen to, ideas provided that you ignore, places to go of learning that you could find, contact with ideas that could change your life, and never take advantage of it. That's the big tragedy. It's to have so much brought to your fingertips, and not to be excited about it. That's what these seminars are for. That's what books are for. That's what messages like this are for. It's to remind people of what all is available. Let us not be cynical, but let us be thankful and reach out and appropriate what's available, and let it affect our lives now and in the future. In my study, the possibilities just overwhelm me as to where people can begin, and then finally where they can go what they can start with, and what they can finally become. And first of all, I think recognize that it's an incredible, exciting adventure. And then if you start working with it, what could I really do if I learned the lessons, adopted the disciplines, read the books, fed on the ideas like bread from my mind?
What could I really accomplish? And the story is always fascinating to us all about where people started, but where they finally ended up, what they finally accomplished. There were dangers along the way, of course, but that's what philosophy is all about. Human philosophy is to give us guidance to avoid the dangers and take advantage of the opportunities. Number one, to earlier recognize the dangers and also earlier pick up the opportunities and make something of them. But I'm constantly amazed at the human spirit, human possibilities. People with the most enormous, struggling problems still manage to rise above them and do something noble, something powerful, something wondrous. I'm always intrigued by that, and I'm intrigued with myself, how I act, how I respond. What is this human adventure on the spinning planet? I'm intrigued by all that. America, nationally, industries, commerce, business, companies, corporations and institutions, education, politics, all the rest involving human beings is an intriguing adventure. I think we need to be curious about it, how it works, and how we can best play our part in family and community, as a citizen, as a company, as a salesperson. Curiosity, develop an appetite for that and just start by saying, I'm going to systematically make some inquiry, I'm going to be a better reader, I'm going to listen better, I'm going to search and start that whole process. And the more you do it, I'm telling you, you'll find something fascinating that'll lead to something else fascinating. And the first thing you know, You've got this on an upward trend to become valuable as a leader, to become valuable in articulating the challenge of the future, competing among the nations of the world. We've got our work cut out for us, but it starts at home, being valuable as a teacher. The key is not to just be a teacher, but be a student teacher. Don't just be a salesperson, be a student salesperson. Don't just be a father, be a student father. Don't just be the leader of a company, but be a student leader. And whether it's a company, corporation, government, school, community, home, family, office, basketball team, baseball team, wherever people gather for whatever reason, if each one brings a better value to that enterprise, to that game, to that family, to that business, to that office, we've got a good chance of competing well among the nations of the world. And who knows what all we can accomplish in the 21st century. Starting with something simple, Mama said, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Good question for my audience today. What if that's true? Someone says, well, if that's true, that would be easy to do. What's easy to do is easy not to do. What if you should be walking around the block every day for your good health and you don't? You're not on a good track. If you should, you could, you don't. It's called the formula for disaster. Self-improvement is about starting with the most immediate thing that comes to your mind that you could do to improve your health your life, your income, your future. And if it's an apple a day, start there. If it's a walk around the block, start there. If you need to build your personal development library, go get a book and say, this is the next book of my new library. If you need to attend the seminar, go. If you need to keep a journal, Mr. Schof taught me to keep a journal starting at age 25. It represents a major part of my library, my own journals, notes that I've copied over the years little poems I've written down, things that I've gathered that are invaluable to me, my business as well as my lecturing career. Go get a journal, start with an apple a day, or a walk around the block. You know it's not going to come in some great package out of the sky. But each little thing you start with called self-improvement, whether it's health or signing up for a class that you've been intending to take and you've put off. Neglect has us all and neglect has us by the throat. Cutting off air supply, money supply and every other supply. But if you reverse that process, and it doesn't matter what you start with, just say, I should, I could, I will. Now say, I should, I could, I will. And if it's an apple a day, start there. Get in a journal, make an entry, go get that next book for your thriving library, sign up for a class, and you have now begun the process. And that's all you need to do is begin the process, and the early return from those early steps will inspire you to start taking all the rest. I've got a good phrase. Everything by longevity tends to get off course. There isn't anything that doesn't need to be looked at fairly often. I've seen more than one person say, Hey, I've got plenty of money in the bank, I'm doing well. But some systems are not working, and failure to take a look at some systems that aren't working. You can get faked out by money in the bank. You've got to look at all areas. An ancient script says, The little foxes spoil the vines. And you look at this vineyard and it looks great, but it's got little foxes. 
And it doesn't matter if it's the president or the government or the senator or the Senate or the company or the corporation or a millionaire or a billionaire. All systems need to be regularly checked. So don't let too much time go by before you take a look and make sure all systems are working. And if you do it with your health, if you do it wherever you are, if the corporation does it, if the government does it, we'll all be better off for the future. Why do some people achieve more success in their personal lives and careers than others? This question has occupied many great minds throughout human history. 300 years ago, Aristotle wrote that the supreme purpose of human life is to live happily. He believed that the important question each of us must answer is, how should we live to be happy? Your ability to ask this question and seek the right answer for yourself, and then follow that answer wherever it leads, greatly influences whether you achieve happiness, and to what extent and how soon. Start by defining your own version of success. How do you define success? If you could wave a magic wand and make life perfect in every aspect, what would that life look like? If your business, job and career were successful, how would they look? What kind of work would you do? Which company? At what position? How much money would you earn? What would your colleagues be like? And most importantly, what would you need to increase or decrease to build the perfect career for yourself? If your family life were warm and comfortable, what would it be like? Where would you live? And how would you live? What would your lifestyle be? What would you want to have and do with your family members? If you were not limited and had a magic wand in your hand, how would you change your current family life? And if your health were perfect, how would you describe that state of health? How would you feel? How much would you weigh? How would your physical health and appearance differ from now? Above all, what can you do right now to achieve ideal health and energy levels? If your financial situation were extraordinary, how much money would you have in the bank every month, every year? How much would you earn from investments? If you had enough money to never worry about finances again, how much would that amount be? What can you start doing today to build your ideal economic life? Interestingly, most people start from scratch or have very few assets. Most of the richest people in America and around the world belong to the first generation, meaning they started with nothing. They had very little wealth and reaped everything they sowed. The richest people in America, mostly super billionaires from the first generation like Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Michael Dell, and Mark Zuckerberg, all started with little capital, sometimes not a penny in their pockets. Sometimes they even had debts, like Sam Walton, who went from rags to riches, worth over a hundred billion dollars when he passed away. Why can these people achieve so much while many others have little achievement? Stanley and Dano asked these people why they feel they have the ability to create financial freedom, while most people around them, even with the same starting point, are still struggling. All 85% of these new generation millionaires gave answers roughly like, I don't have a higher education than 20% smarter, but I'm willing to work harder than anyone else. Diligence is the key. You have to have self-discipline to work hard. You can only succeed if you overcome the tendency to take shortcuts and choose the easy way out. You can achieve sustainable success only when you have the discipline to consistently make efforts over a long period of time. I started from zero. For many years I had to do manual labor jobs to earn enough money to make ends meet. When I couldn't find any more manual labor jobs, I switched to sales. Here, I was stuck in a cycle for months. I started asking the question, why are some salespeople better than others? One day, an outstanding salesperson told me that the top 20% of salespeople receive 80% of the commission the company shares. I've never heard of this before. So that means the 80% of employees below are content with the remaining 20% of the revenue sharing money after the top group dominates the lion's chair. At that moment, I decided that I had to be among the top 20% of the best salespeople. This rule changed my life. The rule is like this. If you do what successful people do repeatedly, nothing can stop you from achieving success like they do. But if you don't do what successful people do, nothing can help you. I also follow this law. You reap what you sow. What you encounter today is the result of your past sowing. So if you're not happy with what you're reaping now, you have the right to decide to start a new season today. Do more of the things that lead you to success, and stop doing things that don't lead you anywhere. The secret of success, oil magnate effort. Once the richest self-made billionaire in the world was asked by a TV reporter about the secrets of success. He replied, Success only requires three things. First, decide exactly what you want in life. Second, 
Determine the price you have to pay to get what you want. Third, and most importantly, be determined to pay that price. Once you have decided what you want, success is not like a restaurant where you pay after the meal. Instead, success is like a self-service restaurant where you have to pay before the meal. Day. Lai once said, There is no elevator to success, but the stairs are always there. Mental and physical health need to be continuously cared for to achieve success, like training a healthy balanced body. So, it's like bathing, brushing teeth, taking supplements. These are things you need to do regularly, every day. Once you start, you have to continue consistently until you achieve all the success you desire in life and career. Become an expert in your field, constantly sharpening your skills, just like physical training. So, if you stop exercising, working out for a while, you can't maintain your health as before. You start to decline, your body and muscles become flabby and weak. You lose energy, motivation, and endurance. To maintain physical health, you have to keep striving every day, every week, and every month. You've heard people say that nothing succeeds like success. It means the biggest reward of success isn't the money you earn, but the talented person you become in the process of effort, achievement, and practice discipline whenever necessary. Chapter 2. Self-Discipline and Character Pursue a higher standard than what others expect of you. Never make excuses, never complain, never blame others. Be strict with yourself and lenient with everyone else. Developing character is a responsibility in life. The ability to build a reputation, to become a person of good character and esteem, is the greatest achievement in both social and business life. Your character today, the deepest essence of who you are, is the sum total of all your choices and decisions in life up to this point. Every time you make the right choice and act with integrity, you strengthen your character and become a better person. The opposite is also true. Every time you compromise, choose the easy way out. Settle for mediocrity instead of what you know is right. You weaken and soften your character. Noble traits encompass a range of virtues and values that a person of good character typically possesses. Among them are honesty, integrity, kindness, tolerance, gentleness, perseverance, and friendliness. However, when assessing the depth and strength of character, above all these values lies the most important virtue, integrity. More than anything else, your level of integrity to live authentically with yourself and others will define your character. In some ways, integrity is truly the value that underpins all other values. When your level of integrity is high, you will be more authentic with yourself and tend to live in alignment with all the other values you admire and respect. However, becoming a person of good character requires you to have very high self-discipline, to have a strong will. Only then can you consistently do the right thing in every situation. You must have both discipline and willpower to resist the lure of quick money, choosing the easy way out, or acting for short-term gains in life. It's a litmus test to assess who you truly are in the depths of your soul. Wisdom can be gained through self-study and reflection, but character can only be forged through the give and take of daily life. When you're forced to choose and decide among various possibilities and temptations, learning about the values you admire, you come to know about values by focusing on them. The Law of Focus Whatever you pay attention to tends to grow in your life. Meaning when you learn about and read stories about people embodying the kind of values you admire and respect, then reflect on those stories and actions, those values will become deeply ingrained in your mind. Once these values are programmed into your subconscious, you'll naturally respond in accordance with those values in crucial situations. The core of character is truthfulness. Every time you speak the truth, no matter how inconvenient it may be, you feel better about yourself and perceive the respect of those around you. One of the highest compliments you can give to someone is to say that he or she always speaks the truth. Lead by example to the person you admire the most. The majority of your character is shaped based on the role model you admire the most, even if they are still alive or have passed away. Whoever they are, take a look back at your past, your life. List the people you admire the most, and write next to their names. Write down the virtues or values that you consider to be their most exemplary traits. If you could spend an afternoon with anyone, whether living or deceased, who would you choose? Why would you choose that person? What would you discuss during that afternoon? What questions would you ask, or what would you want to learn from them? Reflect on this. Why would that person want to spend an entire afternoon with you? 
What qualities and values have you cultivated to make yourself valuable and interesting? What helps you to consistently practice the values that you respect? You develop values by practicing. When a problem arises, people tend to automatically react based on the highest values they have developed up to that point. We build values by repetition, by acting on a certain value time and time again until it becomes an ingrained habit, and we will automatically perform it. Character-trained individuals will act in accordance with their highest values, and they do so without thinking or contemplating. They never question whether what they're doing is right or not. Trust is the deciding factor, and experience is the lubricant of human relationships. In places where there is a high level of trust between people, economic activity will flourish, and opportunities will be evenly distributed among everyone. Conversely, in places with low levels of trust, economic resources are wasted on protecting people from theft and corruption, or there are simply no other economic resources available. Self-esteem, the inner mirror, the second part of character, is self-perception and reflection. Especially before significant events occur, people tend to outwardly express themselves in the way they perceive themselves internally. This is often referred to as our inner mirror. When you perceive yourself as gentle, positive, honest, and possessing high integrity, you will project a greater source of power or capability. Others will respect you more. You feel more in control of yourself and the situation. Whenever you truly behave in accordance with your highest values, your self-image will improve. You perceive and think of yourself in a better light. You feel happier and more confident. Then your outward behavior and expressions will reflect your ever-increasing awareness of yourself as the best person you can become. People tend to accept your self-esteem, at least initially. If you perceive and think of yourself as an excellent person possessing high qualities, then you will treat others with humility, kindness, and respect. In return, they will also treat you as a person of honor and dignity. Self-esteem, the level of your self-love, the third part of character, is how you perceive yourself, the core of your emotions. Your self-esteem is defined as the level of your self-love, but it's more than that. The more you perceive yourself as important and positive, when you truly see yourself as important and valuable, then you will treat others that way. They are just as important as you. Self-esteem is often defined by the appropriateness of your self-image. Try to shape your behavior according to your ideal self-image. Visualize the best person you can become. What you focus on will grow stronger. If today you find yourself not living up to your highest values, then at this moment, decide to confront the situation and resolve it. The moment you do that, you will once again feel happy and regain control. Following the law of focus, what you focus on will flourish and grow in your life. When you think about and discuss the virtues and values that you admire and respect the most, you also establish those values deep in your subconscious until those values begin to operate automatically in every situation. Whenever you practice self-discipline and willpower to live in accordance with the values you most want to be known for, you quickly begin to tread the path of becoming a talented person. The backbone of self-discipline and responsibility, the ability and will to cultivate self-discipline, to take responsibility for your life, is necessary to achieve happiness, health, success, accomplishment, and leadership ability. Taking responsibility is the most difficult discipline, but without it, there can be no success. Both evading responsibility and passing responsibility for things that make you unhappy to others, to organizations, and to circumstances, will completely distort the law of karma, weaken character, reduce determination, and degrade your dignity. It makes you constantly make excuses for very small things. You are taught to believe that you are not responsible for your life. This is very common and natural when you were young. Your parents were the ones responsible. They made all the decisions. They chose the food you ate, the clothes you wore, the toys you played with, the style of your home, the school you attended, and the activities you engaged in during your leisure time. Because you were naive, you did everything they wanted you to do. You had very few choices and little control. However, as you matured, you began to make more and more decisions in all aspects of life. Nevertheless, due to the previous conditioning, you feel conditionally and subconsciously that someone else is still responsible for your life. There's always someone who can or should care for you. When things go wrong, everyone, grown-ups, believe that if something happens, someone must take responsibility. Someone did something wrong. Someone is guilty. Someone must be punished. 
The entire concept of sin and blame leads to stronger emotions than ever. Anger, resentment, and the experience of running away. Negative emotions. Everyone desires the same thing, which is to live happily and benefit in the simplest way. This happiness blossoms when there are no negative emotions. When there are no negative emotions, what remains are positive emotions. Therefore, eliminating negative emotions is your top priority if you want to achieve happiness. There are dozens of negative emotions, but the most common ones are guilt, hatred, resentment, and denial. But ultimately, they all converge into anger, either inwardly or outwardly. Anger turns inward when you suppress it instead of expressing it to others in a constructive spirit. Anger turns outward when you only like or attack others. Resolving negative emotions in the fastest and most reliable way is to eliminate negative emotions. Immediately take responsibility every time something happens and triggers anger or negative reactions in any form. You quickly neutralize that feeling by saying, you're responsible for this. The law of substitution states that you can use a positive thought to replace a negative emotion. Since you can only focus on one thought at a time, when you proactively choose positive thinking, saying, you are responsible, you eliminate other thoughts or emotions that enter at that moment. We can't both have a sense of responsibility and lead, keeping us from being able to both take responsibility and experience negative emotions. When we can't take responsibility without being calm, clear, positive and focused, when you still blame others for something you don't like, you're still in a crackpot mindset. You will continue to see yourself as small and always in need of help, like a victim. So, naturally, you will still blame others. However, when you start taking responsibility for everything that happens to you, you transform yourself into a confident, non-victim person. Never complaining, never explaining, the hallmark of a true leader, a truly noble person, is to take full responsibility for the situation. It's hard to imagine a true leader being whiny and complaining instead of taking action when faced with a problem or difficulty. This reaction may be a feature of superior character. Taking responsibility for your life means determining in advance that you will not be sad or angry about something you cannot influence or change. For example, you won't get angry about the weather or upset about circumstances beyond your control. Furthermore, you especially don't allow yourself to be angry and unhappy in the present because of past unpleasant experiences or situations. You say, what can't be changed must be endured. It's astonishing how many people are unhappy in the present because of an event in the past even an event that occurred many years ago. Every time they think about that negative experience, they become angry and melancholic. The good news is that you can always stop thinking, discussing, and reliving the past. You let go and start thinking about your unlimited goals and future. As Helen Keller said, when you focus on the sunshine, the shadows fall behind. Self-discipline, autonomy, and self-control all begin with you tempering your emotions. You take responsibility for your emotions by assuming 100% responsibility for yourself and your reactions to everything that happens to you. You stop making excuses, complaining, blaming, or liking others for anything. Instead, you say, I am responsible, and you act. In Chapter 4, Self-Discipline and Goals, the ability to cultivate discipline, to set clear goals for yourself, then strive to achieve them, is paramount. Every day will ensure your success more than any other factor. You need goals to accomplish worthwhile things in life. You've probably heard the saying, you can't hit targets you can't see. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. As Groucho Marx said, you miss every opportunity you don't seize. Taking action and spending time deciding what you really want in each area of life can completely change your life. It seems that only 3% of adults write down their goals and plans, and the 3% group earns more money than the entire remaining 97%. Why? Well, the simplest answer is, if you have clear goals and a plan to achieve them, then every day, you are moving straight ahead on your goal path, instead of being swayed by concerns and distractions. You increasingly focus on the straight path ahead from where you are, to where you want to be. This is why goal-oriented individuals achieve more success than those without goals. The secret is that most people think they already have goals, but what they really have is hope and dreams. However, hope is not a strategy for success, and a dream is defined as a goal you don't put effort into achieving. Goals not written down and developed into plans are like bullets without gunpowder. Those pursuing these goals will live in uncertainty, 
because they believe they already have goals, so they'll never have the high level of effort and discipline required in goal setting. Yet, this is the key skill for success, mastering life. Crystal writes that humans are purpose-driven creatures. The simple argument being that we live with purpose, so you feel happy and in control of your life only when you have a clear goal to strive towards every day. This also means the ability to become a lifelong goal setter is one of the skills you will always have to build on. Naturally, the homing pigeon is a special bird. They have an extraordinary instinct for finding their way home, no matter the distance or direction. This is the only creature on earth with this ability besides humans. You also have this very special ability to find your way home, but with a difference. Attention, homing pigeons instinctively locate their nest accurately. Then they can fly straight back to it. When humans set goals in their minds, they may start without any idea of the destination or how to achieve that goal. But somehow, they will start moving accurately. Goals and objectives will begin to turn towards them. However, many are hesitant about setting goals. They say, I want financial independence, but I don't know how to achieve it. As a result, they may not even succeed financially. As a goal, the good news is that you don't need to know how to do that. You just need to know clearly what you want to achieve, and the mechanism to target your goal in your brain will lead you to the goal without getting lost. In Chapter 5, Self-Discipline and Perseverance, self-discipline is using action. The ability to persevere in the face of every difficulty and temporary failure is essential for your success in life. Napoleon Hill once said, Persistence to a person is like springs to steel. The main reason for success is perseverance. The main cause of failure is lack of perseverance and giving up too soon. There is a direct correlation between discipline and self-esteem. Every time you have the discipline to do what you should do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not, your self-esteem increases. That's why there's a direct correlation between self-esteem and discipline. Whenever you persevere and push yourself forward, even when you feel like giving up, your self-esteem rises. Every disciplined action will reinforce every other disciplined action and every act of perseverance will reinforce every other act of perseverance. As you train yourself to persist time and time again, you will increasingly love and respect yourself more. You become stronger and more confident. Eventually, no one can stop you. The reward for perseverance is not just the task itself being completed or the expected reward. Your self-esteem will increase. You feel stronger and more in control of your life, especially in your career. When you make the effort, you're moving towards angels. The fundamental difference between winners and losers in life is very simple. Winners never quit, and quitters never win. You can increase your perseverance by having positive conversations with yourself. Say these words to yourself to prevent any hindrance before you start any task. Prepare yourself mentally by reminding yourself never to give up before you achieve anything worthwhile in life. You must pass the test of adversity, often one of the fastest tests that come to you without warning. Suddenly, you have to face serious obstacles, encounter temporary failures, or even a complete disaster. When this happens, remind yourself that this is a test. This is when you show your courage. This is when you demonstrate to yourself and those around you the strength, character, and determination for success. Self-discipline is crucial in business, sales, and finance. Most people will work in a business field or run their own business. To achieve success in business, you must have a high level of discipline in every aspect of business activity, large and small. Without self-discipline and autonomy in business, no success can come to you. No activity requires more self-discipline than starting and operating a company. Success in our economy today is based on the first law of economics, which is scarcity. Nothing is enough for those who want it, especially never enough customers to sell everything you want to sell, never enough sales revenue to help you achieve all your financial goals, never enough profit to expand on your terms, and most importantly, never enough talented people to collaborate and support you in achieving your business goals. The law of competition states that if the first law of economics is scarcity, then the first law of business is competition. You must focus and have a high level of discipline to perform the necessary tasks to attract the scarce money of customers into purchasing your products or services. To ensure not only the survival but also the efficient operation of the company, you must compete with all other forms of consumer spending for the same amount of money you want to earn through selling your products. The first rule to succeed in business is that you must offer a product or service that people want, need, and are willing to pay the price they accept to get it. 
The price can compete with all other businesses that want to receive the same amount from customers. You must carefully evaluate your products and services to ensure they are suitable for the current market. This is the time when assumptions or incorrect conclusions can lead to business failure. Every week I talk to entrepreneurs who are dissatisfied with their population and profits. They assert that their products or services are excellent and that when consumed in much larger quantities, in each case, I must gently tell them that the only evidence that their products or services are truly attractive is that people are willing to buy them and then buy more, as well as invite their friends to buy them too. All 70% of your decisions in business are based on false premises. This is the average figure when starting a business. You might even be wrong more often. It is not uncommon for an entrepreneur to be wrong 90% of the time. When starting your career, you must have a high level of self-discipline and excellent character to face the possibility that the assumptions and beliefs you trust the most may be wrong. Anyway, this discipline is essential if you want to minimize thousands of losses and redirect your resources into providing customers with more of what they want, need, and are willing to accept. Then today, all the rules of investing and starting a business require a high degree of optimism. You must believe in the future business operations of the company, as well as believe in your new products and services. You must be extremely confident in consumption, to the point where you are willing to bear financial risks and invest many hours, weeks, or even years to achieve business goals. And you must do all of these things when there is no real guarantee that you will succeed. At the same time, you need to have the discipline to restrain your confidence, to remain objective and realistic, because overconfidence in business can lead to mistakes in the win-loss money market, and even bankruptcy. The goal of business is to satisfy customers. What is the goal of business? The goal of business is to create and retain customers in the most cost-effective way. Profit is not the goal of business. Profit is the result of creating and retaining an appropriate number of customers, those who bring integrated benefits after subtracting all costs. What is the accurate measure of the success of a group of businesses? The answer is customer satisfaction. All efforts and activities of your company must aim at the criterion. Please the customer. Satisfy the customer in a way that is better than any other competitor. What is the measure of customer satisfaction? The answer is the repeat purchase. Only when the customer buys your product again, then you have demonstrated that you have fulfilled the promise to the customer when you invited them for the first time. The sale to a satisfied customer requires only 11% of the time and cost compared to the sale to a new customer. All successful businesses depend on doing business with existing customers to truly be a lesson that needs to be trained and practiced. What is the secret to long-term profitability? The answer is recommendation and referral. The basic question that helps determine the long-term success or failure of business is, with the experiences you have with us, do you recommend us to other customers or not? You can only survive and thrive when the majority of your customers are extremely satisfied with the product or service you provide, to the point where they will encourage friends and acquaintances to transact with you because referrals from a satisfied customer make your sales easier by 15 times. Business based on referral is the key to unlocking your future. You need a high level of focus and discipline to develop and maintain customer care policies that make people buy from you, then buy more, and then refer you to their friends. The 10 Commandments of Selling The most important factor in business is sales. Nothing happens until a sale is made. All factories, companies, offices, and enterprises shift into action only when someone, somewhere, conducts a sale with some target. Selling is one of the toughest professions in America. Yet it is also the only profession that one can start with limited skills to achieve one of the highest incomes in the economy. The speed of sales is like driving on the Autobahn in Germany. There is no speed limit. You can go far and fast at your will by stepping on the accelerator of your ambition and determination to excel in the sales industry. Success or failure in business depends on you. Thousands of bankruptcies or defaults have been analyzed for many years to determine the reasons for their failures. After all the data has been sorted into research, nearly every business failure comes from one cause, low sales population. Conversely, whenever a successful company grows, earns profits, increases shareholder value, and provides more opportunities for more people, the reason lies in a high sales population factor. Everything else comes second. Most of your activities in business, whether increasing or decreasing sales, aspirations or agreements or both, attracting and retaining more customers or losing customers, all activities affect sales discipline and increasing sales population. Whether you are a salesperson or a business owner, 
you need self-discipline to focus on increasing the sales population. From now on, every business day, a group of researchers interviewed hundreds of directors and business owners and asked how important is sales and marketing to your company. There are no exceptions. Bile responded that sales and marketing are absolutely essential to the survival and growth of the company. The researchers then conducted a study of the activities of these business owners and senior executives by monitoring how they spent their time in a month. At the end of that time, they completed the calculations and determined that a business owner or director, those who declared that sales are absolutely essential to survival and development, only spent 11% of their time on sales and marketing. The remaining time was spent on meetings, work discussions, paperwork, management tasks, meetings, lunch, and many other activities that did not contribute to increasing the sales population. If you're a sales manager or a business owner, you must cultivate self-discipline to focus the majority of your time and attention on driving your sales team. Once the required population is achieved, you should allocate 75% of your time to working with sales personnel and accompanying them to meet clients, to introduce products and make sales. Handle your paperwork either before or after work hours. During working hours, from the moment you can meet clients, dedicate yourself entirely to increasing the sales population. Chapter 12 On self-discipline and money spending will help you find happiness as you become an adult and earn or receive money. This automatic reaction continues. Your first thought is how you can use this money to be happy. The starting point for achieving financial stability is having the self-discipline to adjust your attitude towards money. You need to tap into your subconscious and touch the ground every second, linking spending money with happiness. This then reconnects the thread of joy to the thread of saving and investing. From that moment, instead of saying, I feel happy when spending money, you will say, I feel happy when saving money. To reinforce a change in mindset, open a financial freedom account at the bank. This is an account where you will deposit money long term. Once your money is deposited into this account, you resolve never to use it for anything other than achieving financial freedom. If you want to save money to buy a boat, two cars, open another account specifically for that purpose. Your financial freedom account is untouchable. You never touch it. Moving that money to invest to earn you higher returns, linking joy to saving. When you start saving this way, something magical happens within you. You begin to feel happy having money in the bank, even when you open an account with just $100 in it. It makes you feel more independent and empowered. You feel happier about yourself as the action of disciplining yourself to save money will make you feel stronger and more in control of your destiny. Every time there's extra money deposited into your financial account, eventually, your financial freedom account will start to thrive. Then, as it grows, you'll activate the law of attraction and the law of accumulation. Because the amount in your account triggers emotions by your own thoughts and feelings, it will create a magnetic energy field to attract more money. If you save $10 a month for a year, you'll be amazed to find that with the money you add to that account, you'll surely have more than $200 instead of just $120. If you save $100 a month, you're sure to have $2,000. The Law of Accumulation If every great achievement is the accumulation of many small achievements, the Law of Attraction will attract into your life things in harmony with your dominant thoughts. Thanks to these laws, your financial freedom account will begin to grow with compound interest exponentially. The more money you have in your account, the more energy it generates, and the more money is attracted into your life. You've heard it said that you need money to make money. This is true. As you begin to save and accumulate money, the universe starts attracting more and more money to you so that you can save and accumulate. While those who regularly practice the principle of saving are completely amazed at how quickly their financial luck changes for the better. But once you adjust your attitude toward money, the rule of financial stability is paying yourself first. Most people save whatever is left after deducting monthly expenses. If they have any left over, the secret is to pay yourself first, above all else. With every dollar you receive, a lifelong truth about saving is that if you save 10% of your income from the time you receive your first paycheck until retirement, you will achieve financial stability, if not wealth. However, Financial advisors today recommend saving 15 to 20% of your income to achieve financial independence goals. Anything less puts you at risk of being short on money in old age. When we suggest to people that they need to start saving 10% of their income, they shake their heads. Today people live, spend what they earn, 
they don't go back to anything bad. People are also drowning in debt. The idea of saving 10% of income without punching someone in the face seems impossible. But there's a solution to this problem. Starting today, save 1% of your income and learn to live with the remaining 99%. This is an amount you can handle. This is a number you can remember. You just need a little self-discipline and a little delay and satisfaction to save 1% each month. Earn $3,000 a month. 1% is $30 a month or just $1 a day. Every day, go home and put your daily savings into the box. Once a month, take that accumulated savings to the bank and deposit it into your financial freedom account. This may seem like a small start, but remember that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Before you know it, you will comfortably live on 99% of your income. Then increase your savings rate to 2% of your monthly income. Then you will adjust your lifestyle to fit 98%. Not long after, this will become a habit. You will find that living on 98% of your income is natural and easy. From month to month, increase your savings rate by 1%. By the end of the year, you will surely save 10% of your income. Then, another memorable thing will begin to happen. Your expenses will gradually decrease as you become aware of saving money and move towards financial independence. You will become wiser and more thoughtful about every expense. You will find yourself spending less and eventually paying off debts. Yes, from month to month, the old 13 rules of self-discipline and time management probably have no aspect of life where self-discipline is as important as in managing your time. Time management is a core part of determining the quality of your life. As Peter Drucker said, you can't manage time, you can only manage yourself. Time management is managing life, managed from self-management, not time or circumstances. Time is something that will self-deplete. We cannot reclaim it. Time is irreplaceable. Nothing can substitute for it. Time is irreversible. Once it has passed or been wasted, you will never get it back. Ultimately, time is the most essential element in achieving any accomplishment. For every achievement, every outcome, every success, time is required. You cannot save time. The truth is, you cannot save time. You can only change how you use it. You can only allocate the use of time from low-value areas to higher-valued areas. This is the secret to success, and it also requires self-discipline and time management. Time management is the ability to select a sequence of events by applying disciplined thinking to the issue of time. You can choose what to do first, what to do next, and what needs to be done, and you are always free to choose. You need a high degree of self-discipline to overcome procrastination and hesitation. Without it, most people on the road to success flounder. A Native American once told me, procrastination is a thief of dreams. The rule of the Pareto Principle, the 80-20 rule, states that 20% of what you do produces 80% of what you achieve. This means that 80% of what you do only produces 20% of the value or less of what you achieve. The core of time management is that you must have self-discipline to reach clear goals and then stick to those goals. You must consciously choose and focus on the most important and valuable task to be done at any given time. Then train yourself to focus on that task with discipline, maintaining focus. The law of efficiency dictates that you will never have enough time to do everything, but there will always be enough time to do the most important things. The lower questions you ask yourself to keep yourself focused and prioritize the most important tasks, activities, and responsibilities. Firstly, why am I being paid? What specific tasks am I here to perform? What results am I expected to produce? You must answer these questions clearly, discuss with others, or ask your boss. What do I need to achieve significant results in which area? Of all the tasks I do, what is the most important result that I am expected to achieve in my position? And which of my activities brings the highest value? In all the things I do, which work contributes the most value to the company and to myself? What work can only I do, and once done well, will make a difference? Currently, how do I use time most valuable to me? Starting today, you should apply the key principles in time management to all areas of life. Apply to work, family, health, diet, exercise, decision making, and financial activities. No excuses. You need a high level of discipline to set priorities, and then follow up on those priorities. You must continually practice discipline and willpower to overcome the habit of procrastination that most people face. However, the more self-discipline you have to use your time effectively, 
the happier you will feel, and the better your quality of life will improve in every aspect. Part 3. Self-Discipline and the Beauty of Life The ultimate goal in life is to live happily. No one else can do this for you. Pursuing this personal desire is the motivation behind every action. Furthermore, happiness is richer in emotions and spirit than having material possessions. In this section, you will understand how applying discipline to the most important aspects of life can bring you more joy and satisfaction than any other quality. Self-discipline and happiness. The ability to achieve happiness for yourself is the true measure of success in your life. Nothing is more important than that. Nothing can replace it. If you have all material possessions but cannot be happy, then you have truly failed to realize your full potential in life. You are truly happy only when you have self-discipline, autonomy, and self-control. Only when you feel in control of yourself can you truly be content. The reason to be happy. The gap between the current situation and the conditions or circumstances that you feel you need to be happy will determine whether you are happy or not. This is a matter of your own assessment and decision making. There is a saying, success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting what you have. When your income and lifestyle match your goals and expectations, then you are satisfied with your situation, then you will feel happy. On the other hand, if for some reason your current circumstances differ from what you truly desire and expect, then you will not be satisfied and also not happy. This satisfaction can change constantly. When starting a $50,000 a year income business may be a great achievement, but once you have achieved that goal, you start to feel unhappy that you're not making $100,000 or more. Some people are not satisfied even when making millions of dollars a year. The interesting thing about happiness is that it is not a goal you can aim for. Achieving happiness is a byproduct that appears when you wholeheartedly pursue something that you truly enjoy with the support of those you love and respect. Ingredients for happiness, health and energy. Perhaps this is the most important factor in a beautiful life. Throughout our lives, we strive for it. Only when you truly enjoy abundant health and a continuous flow of energy can you truly feel happy. In many cases, health is an overlooked need, meaning you don't think much about your health until you lack it. For example, you don't think about your teeth until you have a toothache. You don't think about your body until you're somewhere on it. Good Relationships According to Aristotle, 85% of your happiness or unhappiness comes from your relationships with others. Humans are social animals. We are designed to operate in society, work, and live with others. At a certain stage in life, in order to truly be happy, you must be fully engaged in your life, doing things that make you active and fulfilled. If you're working to make a living, you have to do work that you love, do it well, and be paid well for it. Financial Stability some of the greatest fears we experience are fear of loss, failure, and poverty. We fear scarcity, not having money, and depending on others. One of the responsibilities you have to yourself is to strive for financial independence and freedom throughout your life. The happiest people are those who no longer worry about money. This is not something you can sit back and wait for. It requires purposeful action and high self-discipline. Comprehensive Development it is the feeling that you are becoming everything you are capable of becoming. This feeling arises when you feel increasingly aware of your true potential. Self-discipline and health People today are living longer and better than ever before in human history. Your goal is to become one of them. There is no area where practicing self-discipline is more important than with your health. Your number one goal is to live as long and as healthy as possible. This requires lifelong mental discipline and habits related to health. Being healthy is one of the components of overall happiness. 7 Key Health Habits The Alameda study, conducted on thousands of individuals over more than 20 years, has concluded that the following seven health-promoting habits contribute significantly to longevity. Eating regularly, instead of skipping meals or overeating. Opt for smaller, more frequent meals, ideally five or six times a day. Having a consistent bedtime and avoiding excessive late-night eating or drinking, which can lead to fatigue. Eating moderately before bedtime will help you feel healthier and more refreshed. Avoiding snacking between meals. Regular physical exercise, ideally around 30 minutes a day or 200 minutes a week. This can be achieved through walking, jogging, swimming, and or using exercise equipment. Before the age of 35, 
The leading cause of premature death is traffic accidents, avoiding smoking, consuming alcohol in moderation. In each of these aspects, when you practice self-discipline and have the willpower to resist the temptation of taking the easy path, you will feel happier about yourself, your confidence, and your aspirations. By persevering through any difficulties and obstacles, you will feel stronger, and your self-esteem and confidence will increase. And as you progress step by step towards your ideal, you will truly feel happiness. The development of character is the great business of life. Your ability to develop a reputation as a person of character and honor is the highest achievement of both social and business life. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, What you do speaks so loudly that I cannot hear a word you say. The person you are today, your innermost character, is the sum total of all your choices and decisions in life up to this date. Each time you have chosen rightly and acted consistently with the very best that you know, you have strengthened your character and become a better person. The reverse is also true. Each time you have compromised, taken the easy way, or behaved in a manner inconsistent with what you knew to be right, you have weakened your character and softened your personality. There are a series of virtues or values that are usually possessed by a person of character. These are courage, compassion, generosity, persistence, and friendliness, among others. We'll talk about some of these in part three of this book. Coming before all these values, however, is the most important one of all when determining the depth and strength of your character. Integrity. It is your level of integrity, living in complete truth with yourself and others, that demonstrates more than anything else the quality of your character. In a way, integrity is actually the value that guarantees all the other values. When your level of integrity is higher, you are more honest with yourself and more likely to live consistently with all the other values that you admire and respect. However, it takes tremendous self-discipline to become a person of character. It takes considerable willpower to always do the right thing in every situation. And it takes both self-discipline and willpower to resist the temptation to cut corners, to take the easy way, or to act for short-term advantage. All of life is a test to see what you are really made of deep down inside. It is only when you are under pressure, when you are forced to choose one way or another, to either live consistently with a value or to compromise it, that you demonstrate your true character. Emerson also said, Guard your integrity as a sacred thing. Nothing at last is sacred except the integrity of your own mind. You are a choosing organism. You are constantly making choices, one way or the other. Every choice you make is a statement about your true values and priorities. At each moment, you choose what is more important or of higher value to you over what is less important or of lesser value. The only bulwark against temptation, the path of least resistance, and the expediency factor is character. The only way you can develop your full character is by exerting your willpower in every situation. When you're tempted to do what is easy and expedient rather than what is correct and necessary, the payoff for becoming a person of character, for exercising your willpower and self-discipline to live consistently with the very best that you know, is tremendous. When you choose the higher value over the lower, the more difficult over the easy, the right over the wrong, you feel good about yourself. Your self-esteem increases, you like and respect yourself more, and you have a greater sense of personal pride. In addition to feeling excellent about yourself when you behave with character, you also earn the respect and esteem of all the people around you. They will look up to you and admire you. Doors will be open for you, people will help you, you'll be paid more, promoted faster, and given even greater responsibilities. As you become a person of honor and character, opportunities will appear all around you. On the other hand, you can have all the intelligence, talent, and ability in the world, but if people do not trust you, you will never get ahead. People will not hire you, and if they do, they will fire you as soon as possible. Financial institutions will not lend you money because birds of a feather flock together. The only associates, never friends, you will ever have will be other people of questionable character. Furthermore, since the people you associate with have a major effect on your attitude and personality, you make or break your entire life with the quality of your character or the lack thereof. Aristotle wrote, All advancement in society begins with the development of the character of the young, begins with the learning and practice of values. This means that advancement in your life begins with the learning and practice of values. You learn values in one or all of the three ways, instruction, study, and practice. One of the chief roles of parenting is to teach children values. 
This requires patient instruction and explaining values to them over and over again as they are growing up. Once is never enough. The value and the importance of living by that value must be explained. Parents must not only give illustrations but also contrast the adherence to a value, especially that of telling the truth, with its opposite, that of lying or telling half-truths. Children are very susceptible to the lessons they receive from the important people in their lives as they're growing up. They accept what you say as their parent as a fact, as absolute truth.